Hey everyone, welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. In this episode, Dr. Callie Plattner joins me in what is now session 236 to talk about her work in the area of motivational interviewing. Kelly is the Vice President of Clinical Operations at Mosaic Pediatric Therapy and happens to be a fellow Auburn grad. Now, longtime listeners will know that we've covered motivational interviewing on the podcast before. Back in session 158, my friend Dr. Jim Murphy, who incidentally also happens to be an Auburn grad, discussed motivational interviewing in the context of helping young adults reduce binge drinking and other substance-related problems. Also, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Gavoni, has been talking about motivational interviewing for years. In fact, he's in the process of developing a course on this topic for the project that Paul and I, along with our colleague Anika Costa, have been working on called the Behavioral Toolbox. And just uh, brace yourselves because you're going to be hearing a little bit more about that in upcoming shows. But this background aside, in this episode, uh, Callie gives an overview of what exactly motivational interviewing is and defines the four micro skills of asking open-ended questions, providing affirmations, reflecting, and summarizing. These are the so-called ORS skills. Kelly then discusses the research she's conducted with Dr. Cynthia Anderson, which will be coming out soon in a behavior analysis and practice issue, and more generally talks about how motivational interviewing can be an effective tool to build rapport with stakeholders and possibly improve things like staff and parent adherence to behavior plans, therapy attendance, and so on. So I I think there's a lot of things here that will appeal to many listeners. We've got extensive links and references in the show notes for this episode, so please go to behavioralobservations.com to check those out. And as you've probably heard me say before, while you're at the website, sign up for the email list. We don't send spam or anything like that. All we do really is just send the show notes to you. So if you want these show notes to go directly to your inbox so you don't have to go uh, searching for them, uh, just sign up for the email there. This podcast is brought to you with support from the Michigan Autism Conference, which is taking place on October 11th through 13th in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and online as well. We'll hear more about this event later on in the show, but if you're impatient like me, go to michiganautismconference.org. And use the code MAC10, that's M-A-C and the number 10, to save 10 bucks at checkout. We're also brought to you by the Stone Soup Conference, which is taking place on October 20th. That's a totally online event. It'll be available on demand afterwards as well. Uh, And we'll be hearing more from some Stone Soup speakers in upcoming shows. If you're interested in that, you can just Google Stone Soup Conference, or again, just go to the notes for, uh, for this particular episode. Uh, and if you decide decide to sign up, use the promo code PODCAST to save on your registration there, too. We're brought to you by the University of Cincinnati Online. They designed a Master's of Education and Behavior Analysis program that is 100% online and asynchronous. It just means that you log on when it works for you. If you want to learn more, go to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. And then last but not least, one of our longest time sponsors, Behavior University. Their mission is to provide university quality professional development for the busy behavior analyst. Learn about their CEU offerings, including their brand new eight-hour supervision course, as well as their RBT courses over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. All right, that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, please enjoy this enlightening conversation about motivational interviewing with Dr. Callie Plattner. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Kelly Plattner, thanks for joining me on Behavioral Observations. How are you doing today? I am wonderful. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Uh, we've got a fun topic to delve into. One, we, we haven't talked too, too much about this, and we're going to be talking about motivational interviewing. I mentioned it briefly back in session 158 with my friend from grad school, Dr. Jim Murphy. Um, we were talking about it in the context of alcohol use disorder and things like that, but this is going to be a more rele- conversation that's relevant to practitioners in the field, I suspect. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting more information on motivational interviewing. So uh, looking forward to that. So, um, but before we get into that, I want to look, know a little bit more about your background. So why don't you tell us about how you got into ABA? How did you discover it? And 
what made you want to pursue it as a career? Yeah, absolutely. So um, long, long time ago, when I was in high school, we had to complete a six-week internship at the end of our senior year. And so I chose to volunteer at the Metro School, which at the time was a school in Charlotte for um, children with disabilities. Uh, I loved it. I was completely hooked on working with this population. They filled my bucket up. Um, I felt like I was able to give something in return. Uh, And so then I spent the next four years in undergrad working at group homes for both children and adults with disabilities. And so, you know, during that time, I just kept thinking, there's got to be something more uh, out there to help this population. And um, ABA wasn't talked about a lot uh, at that time. This was in the the early 2000s. So I really had to start kind of doing my own research and uh, ended up investigating or kind of stumbling upon the use of ABA and utilized it as part of a a senior seminar project. Um, But at the time, not a single professor at my college knew what I was talking about. And quite honestly, I didn't really either. So my my next step was to start researching graduate programs and uh, ended up applying to several of our brick and mortar ABA programs that, that were available at the time. Uh, and once I did my interview weekend at Auburn, uh, I was completely sold. I had the opportunity to learn from Dr. Jim Johnston. Um, We had five different practicum learning experiences across different populations, different service modalities. Uh, I just felt like it really couldn't be beat. I'm sure you agree, given your your own history. Yeah, we have to say the the obligatory War Eagle, of course. That's right. Yeah, yeah, War Eagle. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, But it was wonderful. I, I just absolutely fell in love with with our science during that time. Um, So after I graduated, I came back to North Carolina, started my work in residential care at Murdoch Developmental Center. And, you know, since that time, I've focused my work in clinic and community-based ABA organizations. And over the last eight years, have focused primarily in clinical operations and, and de novo growth. So Right now, my my role is vice president of clinical operations at Mosaic Pediatric Therapy. Uh, we support families in North Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee. Uh, I've spent uh, very grateful that I've spent ten years on the NCABA and APBA boards of directors. Have loved and enjoyed volunteering my time in that way. Have been able to learn from, you know, connect with so many smart, super savvy behavior analysts, and more recently, uh, finished up my my PhD under the guidance of Dr. Cynthia Anderson, uh, which is what led me, of course, to be so interested in motivational interviewing, which we'll talk a ton about today. Um, I think my journey into the field of ABA is one where I often really consider how lucky I got to to fall into the field the way that I did, have the opportunities that that I've had. Uh, it's been a lot of fun along the way. So, um, you know, the the impact that our science is able to have on others is overwhelming in a, a really good way. And I think we we just have so much to offer others. So just glad to be a, a small part of it. Are you looking to expand your knowledge, connect with the like-minded community, and accrue those CEUs you've been meaning to catch up on? Well, look no further. Mark your calendars for the 11th Annual Michigan Autism Conference, October 11th through 13th, 2023, in downtown Kalamazoo, Michigan, where we will be planting seeds of change for tomorrow's growth. Our 2023 speaker lineup features keynote speakers Shala Alai Rosales, Rita Gardner, Darnell Latall, John McCacken, Trina Spencer, and Jason Travers along with over 50 breakout sessions as well. We even have pre-conference workshops and a free kickoff event prior to the main conference. CEU packages are available for BCBAs, social workers, educators, and beyond. Be sure to save your spot as early registration discounts end August 18th, 2023. Interested in learning more? Check us out at 
michiganautismconference.org to see the 2023 lineup, past conference archives, and much more. We're still accepting caregiver scholarship applications and have virtual ticket options available for those who are interested. And as an exclusive for Behavioral Observations listeners, use code MAC10, that's M-A-C, the number 10, for $10 off your conference registration. We can't wait for you to join us. I see. That's quite a story. So I'm curious to learn a little bit more about motivational interviewing. So uh, let's let's dive right in. One of the things that, you know, I, I, I'm starting to see this topic come up more and more. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Polly Gavoni, uh, um, has produced a lot of content on motivational interviewing. He's found it helpful, particularly in like the OBM context uh, and school consultation context. And I guess as a uh, shameless plug here, we'll be providing some of that content over at our new website, thebehavioraltoolbox.com. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. All right, shameless plug aside. Um, so, uh, and it's led me to to do some reading on it. I've, I've talked to some companies, um, you know, in, in trainings about it a little bit. So I've got this kind of, uh, you know, cocktail party knowledge of, of, of uh, MI. So I would like you to maybe just give us the the basics. So, in, in in broad strokes, what what is what is motivational interviewing from from your perspective, based on your your scholarship and work in this area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad Polly's doing that. That is uh, one way that we start to learn and and share um, new knowledge. So that that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I find generally speaking that most behavior analysts have not come across motivational interviewing yet in their training. Um, in fact, part of a, a study that we completed currently in press um, surveyed 277 BCBAs and only 11 of them, so 4%, were able to accurately describe MI. Um, so I think defining it here in this conversation is, is definitely a good place to start. Uh, MI is an empirically supported approach. Uh, it is used to build therapeutic alliances. Um, it's collaborative. It's a goal-oriented style of communication. And I think more easily said or probably more uh, useful for, for your audience is to talk about it from a, a behavior analytic perspective. And so in that case, it is a way to effectively build and maintain rapport, um, set the occasion for behavior change, and then reinforce approximations towards that change. There, Within MI, there is um, both a style and a technique for those that are, are trained in it that, that you, they utilize. And I think, you know, given our recent reputational chain, um, challenges, I should say, as well as you know, our, our current awareness about the need for increased compassionate care, the, the use of MI can really set the stage for you know, improving our ability to demonstrate empathy, um, utilizing reflective listening. And both of those things are, are part of the core tenets of motivational interviewing. The, the focus ends up being on um, the way in which a clinician communicates with a client. And so the strategies, and we can talk a little bit more about what those strategies are, um, are purposeful in attempting to uh, sustain and create a more collaborative, supportive, empathic relationship between client and clinician, um, or in, in my case, more often between BCBA and parent uh, of a child with autism. Sounds like Polly's been doing some work with um, teachers, which is also an amazing place to, to utilize this skill. Um, you know, we, we talk so much these days about compassionate care. It's a broad term. It's still relatively new in behavior analysis. And I think as a, a field, we we seem to often think that other disciplines uh, may not have it all figured out. Maybe we see them as less objective or less data driven than behavior analysis. But I, I think that that is uh, an incorrect way of going about it. I, I really think that it would behoove us to step back, consider 
um, the other disciplines do actually have a lot to offer. And, and I think we should start paying attention to it. Um, you know, other fields have been training their clinicians in how to build rapport, how to listen empathically, how to, um, you know, connect in ways that we within behavior analysis have just not yet mastered and and they've been doing it for decades. So motivational interviewing is just one way I think we as a field can start to borrow from other disciplines and, you know, solve uh, one of our current problems without necessarily having to completely reinvent the wheel per se. Hey everyone, I want to talk about Behavior University real quick. And I think the last time I talked to you about them, I was looking at a really cool webinar called My Supervisor Doesn't Know Me. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, if you slept on that one, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, these really cool webinars that they have, uh, they do sell out. So if you see something at behavioruniversity.com forward slash ABA webinars, you're going to want to act fast because uh, they don't have infinite number of seats available. You're going to want to grab those right away. And what will make it easier to grab those seats is the discount for podcast listeners. So if you go to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, there'll be discount and uh, uh, coupon code information there. They uh, have plenty of things coming up. Uh, and there are also many, uh, many trainings that are on demand. They've got eight hour supervision trainings. If you're new to supervision and you want to take that eight hour course, if you have RBTs or potential RBTs needing that 40-hour course, they have those as well. So head on over to behavioruniversity.com, and while you're there, go to forward slash observations to grab your discount for all their professional development offerings. All right, let's get back to this conversation. You know, having uh, friends and colleagues, uh, some of them from the uh, the clinical psych program at Auburn and some of them I've met since uh, that, uh, leaving graduate school, uh, who are in more you know traditional talk therapy settings uh, will will get a lot of uh, a lot of training and not just like hey you know attend this talk or you know in this case listen to this podcast but actually have uh, videotaped interactions with with clients and reviewing it with a supervisor and things like that so yeah I would definitely you know so uh, I'm I'm aware that a lot of other disciplines take this rapport building process very, very seriously and invest a lot of time and resources into um, in, into training staff uh, and again, training in a, in a more hands-on and, and, and less didactic way, I suppose. So um, can, can you talk a little bit, I know I kind of foreshadowed a little bit with a lot of this work being done in, you know, alcohol and substance use disorder circles, but uh, before we talk about um, you know, how this might be relevant in behavior analysis, which of course, I think to most people listening to this, they're probably already making connections, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, what, what is the, what does the research say about this, particularly as it relates to using motivational interviewing and, and, and these other fields that perhaps we can learn from? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much. So there are decades of research to support its use. You mentioned, of course, um, using MI to address drug and alcohol abuse, um, also smoking cessation, uh, gambling, weight loss, medication ad uh, adherence, um, also adherence to medical treatment recommendations. So professionals across a, a variety of disciplines, whether that's physicians, mental health counselors, nurses, social workers, um, even dentists, there's a lot of literature out there, um, dentists being uh, successfully trained to implement MI in practice. And, and you mentioned this, of course, in your experience, but, you know, so many of these disciplines are spending a full semester or more simply on teaching these skills related to rapport building and reflective listening, while we in, in the field of behavior analysis are really just beginning to think about how to offer the, this to, to our clinicians. Um, additionally, research has shown the use of MI can increase engagement in identifying treatment goals. Um, it has demonstrated the retention, um, increased retention within treatment programs. 
and increased uh, adherence to treatment recommendations. So it, it should be really clear to us how these same out outcomes could be hugely impactful to the field of ABA as well. Um, uh, to, to talk a little bit more about the research that is out there, there are a ton of awesome meta-analyses that uh, are looking at client outcomes as well as training outcomes that demonstrate behavior change. Um, and I, I can, of course, share some of those for you to, to put in the, the show notes. But I think one of the best places for BCBAs to start if they're interested in learning more about MI, uh, is to review an article that was published back in 2009 in The Behavior Analyst. Um, and it is titled A Behavior Analytic Account of Motivational Interviewing. I think that it's amazing that we were talking about this approach conceptually through a behavior analytic framework back in 2009, but uh, you know, and unfortunately, just not that much has been done since that time. The the authors of that particular article just did such a beautiful job explaining the mechanisms of motivational interviewing conceptually from a, a behavior analytic perspective. So the same scientific principles that um, you know we all employ regularly are those up upon which MI is built, which is amazing. So while other disciplines may not describe MI the same way, um, they may use language that could potentially feel mentalistic to, to some behavior analysts at times, this particular article really should dis dismantle any misconceptions about MI. Um, it helps readers just to understand how and why motivational interviewing works um, through language that that we're already very familiar with. So highly recommend that article. Um, you know, we as behavior analysts sometimes seem to have a difficult time borrowing from other professions. Uh, we want to ensure that whatever we're utilizing is evidence based and rooted in behavior analytic concepts. But, you know, the the good thing is MI checks those boxes, and and so I think it's it's really worth um, our attention. All right, we're going to take another quick break here to tell you about this year's Stone Soup Conference. They've got a lot of amazing speakers. I'm going to rattle off a bunch of names at you here real quick. Uh, Mark Dixon, Karina Jimenez Gomez, Derek Reed, Meryl Winston, Polly Gavoni, Anika Costa, Florence De Janeiro Reed, and Francesca Delia Espinoza. A lot of these folks are returning speakers as well. So that's a treat for people who've seen them in the past because they get to delve into some topics in a little bit more detail. Again, this is a great event. It's for a great cause. It supports individuals receiving ABA services. And it's for a great – and it, it's really an incredible bargain as well. So it, it's even more of a bargain if you use the promo code PODCAST at checkout. That'll save you $20 on your registration. This is all going down on October 20th, 2023, and it's available on demand afterwards. So – uh, I hope to see you there virtually, and uh, yeah, uh, check it out. All right, let's get back to the rest of this interview. Those are great points. I, I would, you know, it's funny uh, thinking of it, this being used in other disciplines. Um, when I was giving a talk to a, a company, I, I, and uh, they asked me to come talk about like, you know, just, in, you know, just... I guess soft skills and things along those lines. And and one of the things I, I did bring up, am I kind of... Uh, you know, uh, uh, indirectly, but one of the things that occurred to me that would be a good use of this is last summer, um, I had a really bad shoulder impingement and I was in physical therapy for, I don't know, like six weeks. And uh, I was, it turned out I was a terrible physical therapy patient. <laughs> and so far that I, I, you know, I, they, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I was just kind of not necessarily as consistent with the exercise. Of course, you know, when you go to PT, you know, they, they do their thing, but the, the, the major work occurs when, you know, you're doing your exercises that they prescribe you. And these exercises were very long. They were tedious. I mean, it was like a part-time job. It seemed like, yeah. you know, it took a long time to, to, to go through the whole routine. Uh, and um, I, I would, 
you know, af- at, at, after some reflection, I, I could see, okay, you know, this, if there was a little bit of, uh, you know, hey, can you imagine what your life will be when your shoulder is in pain, you know, when you can raise your arm above your head and think, you know, and, and we'll get into what some of those, some of those things are. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing here shortly, but uh, that was, a, you know, so in addition to dentistry and things like that, you know, I think like some of those other allied health fields like physical therapy, you know, are, would be perfect for, for, for this sort of approach. One other area when I was doing some reading background reading on this too, is, um, in um, like diabetes management, you know, and so again, yeah. just a huge uh, area where you really need to cultivate strong motivation, especially when, you know, one of the biggest primary reinforcers out there, you know, food that's terrible for us is going to be, you know, it's going to have a deleterious effect on our, uh, on the, the, the health outcomes of people with those conditions. Uh, and I guess all of us more broadly. So anyway, I just thought I would th- throw that out there and then uh one other thing is um i i I, and i'll put links to these in the show notes uh in in pediatrics uh so i was uh um so uh, dr carolyn Cohn at the university pacific she uh shared with me she and uh dr matt broadhead uh, excuse me dr matt norman i'm getting my mats confused um are uh uh, they've been talking about doing a uh um a review article on motivational interviewing another one like kind of an update for uh, perspectives on behavior science with you know which is the, the then behavior analyst of course uh and, and and hopefully guys if you're listening to this this might be a prompt to uh get you know get that manuscript <laughs> sorted out but anyway um she shared to me with me these awesome videos it was like it was the uh, it was like what you should do and there was like the, also the non example and they had this like super judgmental interaction between a a pediatrician and a and a a mother of a newborn and things like that and then it contrasted that with you know how you might cultivate motivation and th- and was, this was in the context of smoking cessation on the part of a of a, of a new mother uh and, and it it was it really encapsulated all the concepts within you know a few minutes of each video so again I'll put that into the show notes for folks to go check out. And, you know, for if you're new to this program, uh, you can find all the show notes over at behavioralobservations.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for the email list where you get the show notes sent directly to your inbox. Um, all right. So now that we, I think we've cert, I think we've piqued people's interest considerably here. So let's get into the details of, of, you know, some of the specific skills related to motivational interviewing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought up um, your own personal example of of PT and and uh, issues with, you know, adhering to to diet if, if it is really impactful to your health. Um, the way that motivational interviewing can be utilized to really set the occasion for behavior change is so strong. Um, and of course, we know then then can be used for so many different populations. And um, the the examples you gave were were perfect. So, you know, we I want to preface, you know, talking about some of these core MI skills with reminding everyone that the other disciplines spend a semester or more working on the development of these skills. So when we talk about just these four basic skills, you know, I I hope that everyone remembers they are are a very small part of the overall clinical approach. Um, People in other disciplines like their acronyms just as much as, as we do. So the, the four basic skills they refer to are ORS or O-A-R-S, which those stand for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. Um, they are the micro skills of motivational interviewing, and they really serve as a guide for the person utilizing them to be able to convey empathy through the practice of active and reflective listening. Um, happy to, to kind of walk through each of those in, in a little more detail. So um, when you consider open-ended questions, uh, and that, that probably sounds very, very simple in practice, but uh, when you really think about your conversations, you may be overlooking them more, more than you think you are. So a, an open-ended question really requires more than just a yes or no response or more than just a brief answer like good or it's been okay to, to any question. Um, 
For example, an open-ended question is, how was your day versus a closed-ended, did you have a good day? Uh, more specifically to behavior analysts, um, you may ask a parent to um, tell you about the parts of the behavior plan that were most challenging um, versus the closed-ended uh, kind of a, a equal question, um, which might be, are you implementing the behavior plan, which a parent may just say yes or yeah. no. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, so the open-ended question really offers that opportunity for uh, a client to share information without us leading them or, you know, directing the conversation too much. Um, so that's the O in ORS. Uh, the next one is A, which is affirmations. Um, these are my favorite. So they're a statement that recognizes a client's strengths, their efforts, their past successes, um, let's think of an example. So a VCBA might say to a parent, uh, it's clear you are such a dedicated mom. You have worked really hard to secure services for your child. Um, or you might say to a parent, uh, I know you're worried a lot about your child, and this is just an indication of how much you care for them. So those types of affirmations can be so meaningful because they are demonstrating your positive regard for a parent, your care for them. Um, that, of course, can strengthen uh, the therapeutic alliance. So what this subskill does is it allows for us to differentially reinforce um, either a client's certain language about behavior change um, or the steps they have actually taken to, towards that change. Um, so affirmations can be direct. They're supposed to be behavior specific. Uh, and they are just demonstrating that we as behavior analysts appreciate our clients' efforts um, and, and appreciate their strengths. So that's the, the O and the A. The R is reflections, which require a clinician to... Um, respond with a statement that is just indicating that they have actively listened to, to what's shared with them. Um, we talk about it as a way to uh, hypothesize test and, and just kind of ensure that you have accurately uncovered what, what a person is trying to share with you. Um, there are simple and complex reflections. So maybe a, a simple reflection is, uh, I hear you saying you're feeling worried. Is that right? Um, a more complex reflection uh, could take that a step further. And maybe you say, uh, from, from what I've heard you um, share today, it seems like you're feeling really worried about your child's long-term ability to be independent. That's causing you a lot of stress about what to do for them next. Uh, am I, I understanding you well enough or do you want to add more? So it's an opportunity to really ensure that there's no confusion in the conversation. It gives a chance for a parent to clarify what it is that that they're sharing. Um, and so re reflections are just a good way to indicate that that we've been listening. Um, summaries is the S in ORS, so the, the last micro skill. And these can be used throughout a conversation. It doesn't have to just be at the end. But the, the purpose of it is to reflect those relevant statements and then develop a direction um, in a plan for next steps within behavior change. Um, an example here, let's see. Um, for example, you might say, today we've talked about why you feel it's important to toilet train your son. Um, you know that it will ultimately make your life easier. It will give him more independence. But I also know you're a little nervous about it because uh, you, you've not had as much success as you would have liked in the past. Um, we agreed on a plan to work on together and, and we're ready to, to take next steps. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? So that that kind of example of what you would say to a parent is a summation of what you've talked about so far, an agreement on next steps. You've outlined the potential reinforcing variables. So you're saying to the parent, um, I know this is important to you. It's going to make your life easier. It's going to make your child more independent. 
So it, it's just a really great opportunity to uh, summarize the, the rationale for the behavior change uh, and talk about next steps. So ton of research out there to support clinicians being proficient in ORS. Uh, this acronym, this sub-skill of motivational interviewing, um, research has shown that using these four skills increases the amount of information that's being shared, um, improves collaboration. So again, going back to that school consultation piece, um, also increases the likelihood of behavior change. So uh, huge soapbox of mine, but I think these four skills are, are just um, so so critical to our success with the, the people that we serve. That's a helpful rundown. I, As you were describing this, and again, this reminded me of my impressions when I was reviewing it uh, a while back, but it just struck me that, the, the, again, the need to practice uh, these sorts of things and get feedback because it does seem, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that it's there's, there's probably a little bit of overlap uh, across these four micro skills, you know, like there's probably part reflection in a summation, there's probably, you know, part affirmation in a reflection and things like that. So it probably takes a lot of reps to, you know, kind of discriminate the 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 the, the fine details of each one of those micro skills. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, I have found in my own practice that this tends to be much easier said than done. Um, one of the times that I, I utilize these skills or attempt to most often is when I find myself, um, <clears throat> excuse me, working towards directing a conversation too much or offering too much guidance or, um, inserting my opinion too frequently, you know, with parents, taking a step back and, you know, utilizing these skills throughout just gives them a moment to feel like they're being heard and that it's a collaboration with the family, not just you offering up um, potentially unsolicited <laughs> advice. So you are totally right that practice is key, um, easier said than done, but but the impact I think is huge. Yeah, and I could see a you know perhaps some utility and perhaps after a, a a parent meeting or something like that to to maybe do some structured reflection on you know did you hit all those those micro skills in your conversation or you know the extent to which the opportunities provided themselves to so um all right very good so you 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 talked about some of the research you've done on this uh some of the stuff that's in press and ongoing. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about your scholarship in this area? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the, or a couple of the questions I, I should say, um, that are still out there is, you know, up until recently, we have not known whether or not we could teach these skills to BCBAs, if BCBAs were interested in learning uh, and using these skills, and we still don't know if parents of children with autism who experience this approach, uh, if outcomes will change uh, accordingly. So um, utilizing motivational interviewing within the field of behavior analysis had not yet been empirically studied uh, up until the work that that Dr. Cynthia Anderson and I most recently completed. Um, also, uh, of course, a, a huge shout out to to Dr. David Cox and Dr. Mary Jane Weiss for for their support on the projects as well. Um, but our study, I think, is just uh, an initial step in the exploration of of MI in behavior analysis. I mentioned before um, survey results. That's one paper that that should be coming out within the next um, few weeks, and and then the the secondary or, or more experimental um, study, which I'm excited to talk about, uh, really had a couple different questions in, embedded. There there were two main questions. the The first was, does a just a brief virtual training impact uh, BCBA's ability to demonstrate MI skills. Uh, and then the second question was, does that same training impact a BCBA's knowledge of MI concepts? So it's two different things, skill and then knowledge. Um, we, we completed a 
randomized control trial with 51 BCBAs. So they were randomly assigned to either weightless control or to treatment, which was a um, brief motivational interviewing training. And that training focused specifically on situations that BCBAs often encounter when working with caregivers. Uh, it was a virtual training. It had active responding embedded throughout that allowed us for um, to check for understanding. And given all of the constraints of COVID at the time and the, the increase in interest in virtual training, we felt that that training mod modality would be well received. Um, and it was, which is great. So our, our findings were extremely promising and demonstrated that the, the training resulted in statistically significant improvements across those core MI skills. Um, so the use of open-ended questions, affirmations, and reflections all increased. Um, and also we saw statistically significant increases in BCBA's knowledge of motivational interviewing. One of the measures that we utilized uh, is called the Helpful Response Questionnaire, or HRQ for short. It's a, a frequent measure utilized within MI literature, and uh, it can be adapted to different populations and situations. So we revised it to be in line with the types of situations a BCBA might encounter when interacting with parents. So the way that it worked was a parent would read this, or excuse me, a participant would read the scenario and then respond with what they would likely say in that situation. Uh, their responses were then coded for the use of MI core skills. Uh, I, I was really pleased with the results. I, I think when um, the article comes out, when you're able to really see the graph, see the, the behavior change, I think it's going to have a, a meaningful impact on, on people's interest in, in learning more, which, which was the, the hope of this. So, um, you know, Given the the brief nature of the virtual training, um, the format of the training being virtual, I think it makes me hopeful and it, it really sets the stage for more in-depth training, role play, behavioral skills training, um, and other approaches that we may see even a more significant behavior change with the use of these skills in practice. So, um more to come on that uh, article and in the sharing of, of those results uh, in the coming months, but I am very excited about it. Well, congrats for finishing such a, what sounds like a, a massive undertaking. What, um, what outlet are you going to publish it in? Um, so it's currently uh, being reviewed in behavior analysis and practice. So uh, that that's where people can keep an eye out for it. Okay. Last break of this program. Balancing work and life can be difficult, and that's why the University of Cincinnati Online designed a Master's of Education in Behavior Analysis program that's 100% online and asynchronous, meaning you log on when it works for you. Their student success coordinators will work with you from start all the way until graduation to ensure you are receiving the support you need. Graduate in as few as five semesters as well. The program is FAFSA eligible, and UC also offers a business partnership program to offer tuition discounts to eligible employees. If you want to learn more, go to, to online.uc.edu and click the Request Info button. All right, let's get to the rest of this conversation. I guess hearkening back to what we were talking about earlier is that, uh, yeah, so you, there's this virtual train that they received. And again, I think you were just kind of maybe speaking to that is that, you know, the, the what if questions that stem from that. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, what if the, the participants even got e even more skilled in this area, you know, mm -hmm. would the, would the outcomes be even more? Um, and I can see this certainly also in addition to, you know, kind of, uh, parent and, and client interactions being again, really helpful from, a from an OBM perspective as well. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 you know, again, the applications here are, seem almost limitless. Um, uh, again, congratulations on on getting that uh, that that study uh, complete, and hopefully, we'll we'll see it in print here very shortly. Thank you. So, when you talk about this technology, if you will, uh, what what has been the re reception to it? Uh, you know, n n not just in terms of. Uh, yes, I'm interested, I guess, on a couple of different levels. Certainly, I'm interested in, in the the reception that the participants had, you know, in terms of, you know, did, did they um, did they feel that this 
interaction strategy is 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 helpful uh, is is it acceptable is preferred you know you know is it you know you know, kind of look at all those kind of social social validity indicators uh i'm also curious what the uh, the what, what what the reviewers uh, thought of it and maybe that's not a um uh, again, it sounds like that's still underway, so maybe the jury is still out on that. But I'm just curious, uh, on a couple of different levels, what has been, you know, how well received ha- has this work been? Yeah, I think um, that's important to talk about because there, I think there are different responses dependent on the degree to which someone has been exposed to MI. Um, So for those who have heard about it before, uh, I find that they're interested in learning more. When when I've shared the results of this study at conferences and and started to talk through the the conceptual underpinnings of motivational interviewing, um, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. And I've had a, a ton of practitioners either ask for additional resources or companies ask for ongoing training in the area. So I think there is a real space here for this approach in our science. Um, and I also think it's going to fill some of the, the recent calls for improvement within the area of compassionate care with curriculum and evidence-based approaches um, that are already uh, available to us. So it it may be slow going as, as anything is with uh, you know, a lower volume of BCBAs who are currently trained in the approach. Um, limited literature in the area, uh, and the fact that up until this point, I'm not yet aware, but I I could be wrong. I hope someone reaches out to me if I am wrong, um, that it's not being utilized yet within behavior analytic graduate training programs, but but I I think there's some some real opportunities there. Uh, You know, you asked a little bit about the BCBA's willingness to, to adopt um this approach and the social validity results from the study were probably in many ways more promising than than some of the the behavior change so um one of the questions that we wanted to ask at the the start of the training or we did ask i should say um it was embedded in there so before they even got through the training they they were responding um, and, and reporting on their comfortability with borrowing from another discipline uh, and if they believed that motivational interviewing was evidence-based. Of course, this was before they really knew what it was and, and had a chance to learn more. And so it was really interesting to me that the initial response prior to the training was was not all that positive. Um, but the change in that response after the training was incredible. So I think it just goes to show if we're open to learning that we're we're going to come across approaches that can really improve our clinical practice. We just need to be be open to um, those possibilities. So uh, some of the the details from the social validity results, uh, 100% of participants agreed or strongly agreed that MI improved their ability to communicate, uh, improved their ability to actively listen, uh, improved their ability to manage difficult conversations, um, and also 100% agreed or strongly agreed that um, MI is applicable to their ongoing parent interactions and that it's evidence-based. So I'm so glad that that was, was a change over time for, for participants after the training. Um, you know, m- more importantly, and I, I think to answer your initial question, um, 100% of participants also agreed or strongly agreed that this should be taught to students of ABA, um, that they would recommend it to others, and that it's an important skill for BCBAs to develop. So that in and of itself just made me feel so encouraged to continue working on this. Um, the results are cool. And, and it was one of the reasons that we selected a group design as opposed to single subject. We really wanted to um, consider the impact uh, of the introduction of a new clinical approach and, and what that would have on BCBAs. And, and so we wanted to understand that through the lens of a, a larger group of, of clinicians. It, you know, our hope is that at least in an introductory manner, understanding MI's feasibility, 
its usefulness, its acceptability um, within the field was was important. And I, I think that we have at least in an introductory way um, have some some support for that. Fantastic. What um, is this something that you folks at, you know, you're, you mentioned in the beginning that, you know, you're uh, on the executive team, I guess, at, uh, at Mosaic. Is this something that, that you guys are implementing uh, in your organization? And I don't want you to have, you know, don't feel the need to spill any secrets or anything like that if, if you don't want to. But uh, I'm just curious from, a, again, from an organizational perspective as well and how you guys might be using it specifically in, in your organization. Yeah, um, no, no secrets. I, I love talking about this. So we have integrated it into our student program and our BCBAs have taken an introductory training in MI. Um, there's a ton more that we could be doing. So uh, the advancement of the MI skill set takes a while. It also takes quite a bit of supervision and coaching. So um, we haven't expanded that model to include that quite yet, but something that that I want to explore uh, and, and work more on. I think, um, you know, part of uh, the, the survey study that we also did was looking at <clears throat> the challenges that early career BCBA, BCBAs encounter in parent interaction compared to those same challenges later in our, our careers and how those change over time. And so my hope is um, embedding it into our student program, uh, into our practicum work is an opportunity to set clinicians up for success, um, set them up for the ability to enhance those therapeutic alliances with families at the onset of their clinical practice. Um, and hopefully reduce some of the stress that's associated with um, parent interaction that that I think we we've all um, encountered over time. So uh, really excited about continuing to to build up this training program um, within our organization. But I definitely think there are some larger scale opportunities for training within um, CEU events, within graduate practicum um, trainings. I mentioned before the helpful response questionnaire. I think this is an awesome way um, for graduate professors, for um, practicum supervisors to assess a uh, clinician's or a student's change in skill over time. So I'm working right now with Endicott College to integrate this approach into one of their, their graduate courses uh, as part of a follow-up study. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on how that uh, unfolds. Um, and Polly works there too. So maybe I need to, to collaborate with, <laughs> with him on some of this work. Um, so the, the HRQ is just an awesome way to assess skill, provide specific feedback, track behavior change over time. Um, it, it, of course, can be utilized within the classroom or, or with a supervisor. But one of the additional things that I'm so very excited about is um, utilizing it in the context of interviewing. So we we all want to employ BCBAs who are compassionate, who are empathic, who utilize reflective listening, you know, both for the parents they serve, but also for their coworkers and their supervisors. So assessing these skills up front, I think, through the context of an interview can potentially be a really effective way to identify a BCBA's skill in interacting with others um, and building rapport. Uh, so those are just a couple of my current ideas and how to integrate MI into to training and, and clinical practice. But um, I, I got a lot of things swimming around up here that I want to work on. Funny, I'm 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 going to a a social gathering of a handful of BCBAs tonight, and uh, I can't wait to share this. I'm sure they will be all over this, and we'll be wanting more information on it for for those reasons and and much more. So uh, this is all very exciting. Um, I feel like we've just run through a, a, just a ton of information in a short amount of time here. I I, I want uh, are there other um, aspects of motiv motivational interviewing that you want to bring up that I haven't thought to ask. Um, I don't want to leave any stone unturned here for the, obviously we could probably do multiple episodes on this, but just from the standpoint of a, of a, 
you know, kind of uh, broad strokes overview, you know, uh, are there other things the listeners should know about this uh, um, before we conclude our, our chat here? Yeah, I think uh, we talked quite a bit about ways in which it can be integrated into our, our training programs and, and clinical practice. And of course, there's some research questions that have yet to be answered in terms of the format of training, um, training modalities and ongoing supervision, uh, ongoing coaching and feedback. And, and all of those are good questions to ask. One piece of it that we haven't talked about that I do think is really critical is um, answering questions as it relates to how motivational interviewing has an impact on the parent perception of the therapeutic relationship. So does the use of MI skills uh, by a BCBA improve a parent's perception of their rapport with their clinician? Um what components of motivational interviewing are most impactful to that parent-clinician relationship? Um, does the use of MI skills increase parent adherence to tra- treatment, um, attendance to meetings and sessions? And so while I think many of, of these questions have been answered in the context of other helping professions, we really don't know yet the effects of MI on the perceptions of parents of children with autism. And I think from a next step social validity standpoint uh, and to improve our outcomes, that's where we need to focus a lot of our work. So if anyone out there is listening and and wants to work on some of this with me, I'm happy to to continue the conversation. I see. And it looks like just a uh, unlimited reservoir of thesis and dissertation topics. So uh yeah lots lots of lots of things to look into lots of questions that still need to be answered absolutely well uh again this has been a a really educational conversation for me uh i really enjoyed hearing about this and i look forward to seeing your paper in behavior analysis and practice and i'm sure other uh, uh other initiatives you might have down the road so um thanks again for for joining me uh how about you uh how about you take us out with some advice for the newly minted bcba Sure, I'd love to. Uh, okay, so for n- newly minted BCBAs, my my recommendation to you is find your mentors. Um, just a few people who can be your trusted colleagues within the field. Um, they can have the same number of years of experience as you. They can be those that are well seasoned. I think the goal here is to find your tribe of people where you can safely ask your questions share your concerns, um, push one another to do better, being comfortable making mistakes because you're, you're going to make a lot of them and and that's okay. Uh, being comfortable in the uncomfortable is where you need to start sitting because for me, even after 15 years, uh, there are several times a week where I have to say, I don't know, and I just have to figure it out. So I I think for our newly minted clinicians, um, most importantly, just remember how powerful our science can be, um, how to use it to make the greatest impact possible for those that we serve. We are so very lucky to be in this field. And I think it's just important that that we remember that every day that we go to work. All right. Those are great words to end on. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.